So we're going to talk about the curriculum framework part two. Once again, this kind of had its evolution out of these, uh, and especially the Partnership for Food Protection, which formally adopted going into this whole process. So we want to thank the Partnership for Food Protection. And in fact, again, um, there's been so much involvement in the Partnership for Food Protection and all the associations and state and local and federal employees that have been coming together on all this. So we just want to keep that in mind. Do you remember this morning when we talked about the bubble chart, right? And do you also remember Dr. Solomon talked about this vision that FDA put out in 2010? And that, um, you probably all remember some of those slides, but the one in particular that I remember, and this, as you remember, kind of teed up, uh, uh, was a prelude to the passage of FSMA. The one that I always remember is, is uh, in terms of a training and, and certification, what are we, what's our goal? And so if you remember back then, Dr. Solomon's slides talked about a competent workforce doing comparable work. So that's kind of the goal. Now, these steps that you see below here, these um, are kind of a recent iteration of, of this. And so I want to talk about um, performance steps, and we'll see that on the next slide that talks about performance cycle. But let me talk first about these steps. And really, this kind of came out of a project uh, that had to do, and I know Claire's here, and she was involved in the IOM, Institute of Medicine, um, efforts uh, globally to look at capacity building. And that's where this kind of came out of. So there was some work done in terms of capacity building and looking at other countries' food and medical products. And how do we identify capacity building needs in a, in a process for a uh, foreign country, and it could be an emerging country. And so this is where some of these steps um, came from. So first uh, is defining performance expectations. So we're talking about competencies all day today, all day tomorrow. And so uh, this won't be the first time you hear competencies are observable and measurable. So we start there with the competencies, and that's the frameworks. The frameworks we're going to hear more about uh, is kind of the first step, and is in with this um, IO, or this uh, capacity building project through the uh, Office of International Programs. This was the first step of looking, starting with the competencies. But the next step, performance competency assessment, was identified as kind of a tool, and in fact, this tool that was developed for the OIP project is being um, tested out in terms of, you all are aware of other capacity uh, building assessments, you know, in-country assessments for whole programs. And this is a part that gets at the individual in those agencies around the world. And so the performance part is an assessment. And so that is a two-pronged thing. First, a self-assessment where an individual takes the competencies and says, how do I stack up? How do I think I stack up individually against these competencies? Followed by a supervisor or someone in management that says, here's, what, here's how I think my unit or individuals within my unit stack up against these competencies. So this is kind of the practical approach to this. So once that assessment takes place, the next step would be a process where gaps are identified. So the supervisor, the agency would look and say, you know, everyone either scored themselves low or the supervisor scored the unit, work unit low in HACCP, knowledge of HACCP or whatever it is. And so there's a gap. Or here's a big gap between how people see themselves and how the management sees the workers. That could be a gap. So there's different ways of looking at a gap in performance. And so this, self, this assessment part is a critical part. So once those I gaps are identified, there could be so many gaps you can't address all those gaps all at once. And so um, this profession, next step is a professional improvement plan. So this is where the work unit or the supervisor or management looks at the gaps and says, you know, here's how I'm going to address them. And here's the only ones I can't address now, but there's maybe there's so many gaps I can't address all those gaps all at once or all these competencies that need to be addressed. And so uh, that plan is put in place. What can we reasonably do to start addressing some of these gaps? And it could be a cycle that continues. Um, after the performance improvement plan is put together, or the professional improvement plan is put together, uh, 
then a treatment is identified. And we're going to talk about treatments. And we use that term um, uh, on purpose because a training is one treatment. There could be other treatments. Okay? So we're going to talk about what some of those things are. And then the reassessment part. So that is where, okay, for this cycle, we can only address these gaps or these competencies. So we're going to put a treatment in place. And then next year, we're going to go through another um, a reassessment and we're going to identify more. So this is a, all this is is a practical approach. And here you have in your book um, the cycle, starting with expectations or the metrics or the competencies, assessing, identifying gaps, professional improvement plan, a treatment, and then a reassessment, and then a continuous cycle. Yes, question. Just a question with the use of the word treatment uh -huh. um, in terms of choosing that word. So for me, and maybe it's because of my medical background, but that implies that that employee is ill or deficient in some way. And so to me that has a negative connotation, and I don't know if you thought about that in the development, but I, I winced a little bit when I heard that okay. word used. Well, I, I think that'd be great if we can come up with a, a better term. But we wanted, I think the point we were trying to make was <clears throat> training isn't the answer to everything. And that there are multiple things an agency has at its disposal that it can use. And, and when I go through my list, ho let's hold on to that because when I get to this list of treatments, maybe someone will look at that and say, hey, let's call it this. So good point. And I, I did think of that because from a medical or veterinary standpoint, you're right, treatment really means something, and it all, almost means like we've got to do something to this patient. Okay, Roberta? Yes, um, so what you just described sounds like you're talking about an individual organizational component, and um, you know, what we hear from industry you know, quite a bit is uh, one district will do an inspection one way, another a different way, they'll draw different conclusions and or they could make that comparison between a federal and a state investigator or an inspector. So is it, you know, we would need to do this at a very kind of a horizontal um, level as, as well. So have you given thought about, you know, thought to that or how we might do that? That's a great question because, you know, um, I think when this was developed and, you know, we kind of have in mind some of these um, emerging countries that have perhaps uh, need help with their regulatory programs. And so we're talking about maybe not so many staff, and that could be one of, their, one of the problems that a lot of countries have. But you're right, in, when we're looking and trying to apply this across the FDA or across the whole inter integrated food safety system, this could get overwhelming, and uniformity is going to be a really important part of this. So I think what we hope to show is that if you keep this cycle in mind and then we talk more about the competencies and the framework and everything we can measure and, and put uh, below the hood of the framework, maybe there's a way that we can then have common ways that we do these assessments and identify those gaps agency by agency or across the profession. Yes, question? Anybody ever ask, like, PIP for the performance improvement plan? Like, that's just a scary term. And, like, when I see PIP, I see a negative yeah. connotation with it. Uh, I know it's probably not performance. It's shared across everybody's work, but I know it means something different. But mm -hmm. when I see that, I'm like, yikes, I got in trouble. Uh, that's yeah, and, and you're right. And so again, terminology is going to be important. I think this was developed with the management of the agency in mind. And so if we need to socialize this in another way, I think, I think everyone's open to that. Lonnie? Oh, Claire. Another thing I, I think you might want to bring into this is time frames, because you may have short term, long term, right. or maybe long term, and in between that, you want to have that reassessment even yeah. before you get to the actual right. final expectation. So the reassessment should be going along the Yeah, the and, and prioritization as well. Change right. Lonnie? As we go through this, I want to remind folks, let's, let's not try to get hung on the exact words we're looking at. We need to look at these words within the context or the area that are being used. Good point, treatment. Treatment means one thing in the medical realm, it means something completely in the education or the performance realm. It also means something very different if you're a painter. 
applying wall treatments. So the word can be used in multiple different ways. So let's not get hung up on a single definition, but recognize it within the context with which it's being used. For instance, a performance and uh, a professional improvement plan is something that's very common to the performance cycle. But a performance improvement plan is something that's common to the HR world in terms of making somebody better at what they do because they've been efficient in what they've been doing. So let's not get too hung up on the words themselves, but the context in which they're being used. So now let's set aside a second, you know, the, how the performance, so we can measure performance against. Let's, let's take a little bit of a step back and now look at what's been put together at DHRD <clears throat> in terms of the development process for the curriculum. So this evolved out of the competency and curriculum frameworks, but we actually have, uh, and DHRD has put together a 10-step process. This is going to be the overarching process that's used to look at curriculum development. And so we're going to spend time on each one of these steps, but for now, if you look in your book, you'll see uh, audience is the first step, competency framework, that's what FW is, and then the curriculum framework, and there's going to be examples of that on the wall on the side here. So we'll talk about those. Then we're going to, the next part of the, the step in the process is the broad competencies, identification of broad competencies. We'll look at examples of that. Then narrower competencies, and really we'll see that at some, in some instances these narrow competency developments really almost get down to the learning objective level in some cases. Out of that then, here's some the unique parts of the process after we put all the, the metrics together. The next part is then to have uniform ways of planning. So these planning documents will be developed, which in turn become blueprints that get turned over to the learning design and the development process. So we're going to see examples of that. So the planning documents from the competencies get turned over to uh, learning event design and then course development or for better term treatment development whatever that treatment is. Now what's also unique or identified in the in the process is that we have to then figure out you know that's fine to develop everything against that we need a check and a balance and so this quality review step we'll talk about that where the design team and the development team finishes and this is important when we uh, look at the process that's going on now with the gen ed development between six different, um, oh, there goes my signal, between, sorry, I'll have to keep looking up here, uh, between the six different developers is that um, now we can have multiple people doing development, not just one agency, and we have a process then to take, you know, not only do they build and develop everything based on, on the things we want measured, but now they turn it back over and some, uh, another peer review group will look at that and go back and see if they really did all that. And so there's the quality check. And then once that quality check passes, the, next, the last step is the actual placement into the curriculum. And then hopefully users will be able to go to the curriculum framework, drill down. They need a treatment for their staff and they'll be able to go down and find a course that's been through the curriculum process and been identified as meeting the national curriculum. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail on each one of these steps. Okay. Before we do, uh, just uh, uh, again, we're talking about outcomes based. That's why everything is built on things you can measure and things we want people to know or do or have the ability to do. And here's that slide I talked about where learning events or treatments, so here we call them learning events, so maybe that's a better term, Sharon, uh, but maybe we'll think of another one. So training could be one, education could be one, and this is important because we've talked, when, and we've had a lot of academicians involved in looking at the framework and helping develop the framework both here and in Canada and in other areas, and they recognize that there's a lot of things that uh, people can come to the job with that they get at the university. So there's a lot of interest in looking at professions and saying how can we at the university level uh, make sure that people um, obtain those kind of competencies so they're better, so they're more hireable and so that the agencies can say hey uh, 
I, if this person has achieved these competencies already in their education, then that's less of a chore at, a, at the agency level to have to train them. And that especially, as we talked about earlier, works for those education or knowledge-based competencies, mm -hmm. but not necessarily just for those. But job experience, coaching, coaching could be a learning event, mentoring, certainly, networking, workshops, conferences. I've always been a proponent of, of learning taking place by attending, and especially that's part of the standards as well, uh, looking at uh, your employees going to conferences, networking, finding common areas for them to network, job shadowing, standardization is an example. If you look at the retail arena, on the whole standardization process, that could be a learning event. And, you, and Rance, I, you are more of an expert than I am, but I'm not sure, maybe we can talk after about, would certification you know, qualify as a learning event or a credentialing? Assessment, there could be other ways, and hopefully none of these look negative. So hopefully, maybe, uh, maybe that'll be something we can give a prize to someone who comes up with a better term than treatments. So thanks, Sharon. So, you know, please keep in mind that this is not an all-encompassing list, but one of the things that Lonnie had shared a story with us uh, about is a job aid. And uh, it's something that somebody thought they needed training on, but when you really get down to it, you just needed step-by-step -step instructions right there where they need to do the job. So a job aid, uh, uh, Craig brought up, and I think of that when I, you say job aid, I think of some of the work that uh, I know UC Davis, I know uh, UC, uh, Tennessee is doing, and I know Auburn's done. Um, looking at things like apps. And so an inspector in the field, they're in a situation, hey, there's an app for that. Let me do a quick brush up or a quick refresher while I'm in, in doing an inspection. Okay, got it, it's a job aid. So that I think of that when I think of job aid, but it could be a you know, brochure, it could be anything. So good. If you can think of other treatments as we go along or learning events as we go along, let's add those to the list. So training might not be the answer. Yes, Kevin? You described this as curriculum process. Can you just help me understand if you mean <clears throat> the process that people like sitting in this room will use to identify a curriculum, or are you saying this would be a process that an individual program manager would follow by which to develop their own training program for their own staff? Okay, so, so that's a great distinction, and I'm glad you stopped there. So I think what we're talking about here is the curriculum process that DHRD has developed and that we are going to be looking at when we build this national curriculum. The way you interact and the way stakeholders interact within that process will vary. And so one of those, if you're, for example, a, uh, a manager of people, you will use the process in a certain way to assess, as I showed that first performance cycle, maybe that's how you're going to use this. But so you're right, to, to make the distinction, we t it's not an individual that's going to do the process, it's the process that has been, the steps in the process that have been identified, and then how you play a role in any of those given steps. On the last day, we're going to talk a little bit about stakeholders and different stakeholders, and maybe some of the things they're looking for out of this. Does that help clarify, Kevin? Okay. Okay. Yeah, another question, Brian? Just in the way of trying to understand here, when you go through the process, presumably you've got, at the state and federal level, you've got thousands of people obviously have been doing this for a lot of years are very experienced and knowledgeable are very confident of what they do and maybe you're going to talk about this later I mean how are you going to sort of map out and grandfather these people in so I mean you can't be expected to start going through and taking all these courses and to be able to evaluate them and say somebody with 15 or 20 years experience they fit in at level two or level three based on I mean, is it, you're going to go and evaluate each other and do it through competencies? Have you thought about how you might facilitate this to make it, I mean, make it a little easier? All yeah, that? and I think all along we've, de we've um, understood that you just can't flip the switch and say, okay, from this date forward, we're all going to do it this way. Uh, and it has to, you're right, it has to be a kind of a process where, um, and we've talked about this a lot, especially with FISMA, uh, that, you know, there's a whole new set of needs now with FISMA in terms of training. But, you know, we have to move, move things along and not wait sometimes for the whole process to take place. So we've talked about that a lot. And so I think the same would apply for, 
you know, people in the system. You know, if you've been on the job 40 years, you don't have time, to obviously, to go through every step of the process. And it's going to take time for, you know, um, metrics, especially at the agency level or the management level of agencies, to identify the metrics that are kind of high priority, and then how do they assess their staff, and how do they um, provide a learning event. Now Sharon's got me not saying treatments. Um, for, for that. And so you're right, Brian. There's just no way you're going to flip the switch and say, okay, starting today, everybody's going to start at step one and go through the whole, the whole system. So I think, I think we realize it's going to have to be in stages and it has to be um, somewhat catered or, or uh, customized for certain audiences. Does that anyone have, Craig? Yeah, so, uh, Brian, if I can answer that a little bit. Um, I'm going to go back to what Stan said initially about we need to think differently. And instead of thinking about sending people back through training or retraining them every three years, when we take a competency approach and we talk about assessment, what we can do with the people that are, have been in it for a while or even they have, or new on the job is look at their competencies and have them do the self-assessment, do the supervisory assessment, and do some sort of performance-based assessment as well, which we haven't gotten to yet, so that we can look at what training do they act for you know, treatment or interventions, another word that we use, I didn't want to use that one, so. Um, but what is it that we need to target those gaps rather than just broad brush training? So we don't have to send somebody to a week-long training if there's certain competencies that they need. So, and I always like to use uh, driving a car. Well, someone can know how to drive a car, but they not, may not know how to ride a motorcycle. So we're not gonna send them back to learn how to drive a car, but just those competencies for motorcycle training. Does that make sense? That's the other thing about, remember we talked about um, content areas and co each content area is not one course. And just as Craig just brought up, <clears throat> um, a course may address a number of competencies and a course may be needed for certain people, but um, modules or individual competency events uh, could be uh, a tool. 